Hello, everyone. I see a few people joining. Thank you so much for finding the time to join us today. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we will um, talk just for a couple of minutes to let everybody join who wanted to join us today. Um, today, we're going to talk about a very exciting topic for many of you, the Hackett Group's 2024 Key Issues Study for Procurement. But before we begin, please let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, the country or the state. We're very curious to find out. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, let's see. While we're uh, having people join, let us introduce ourselves briefly. My name is Lada. I'm a community manager here at Precoro, and I'm going to be your humble host for today. And let's hear from our today's guest, Kurt. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, Lada. This is Kurt Albertson with the Hackett Group. Hello for everyone who has joined. Uh, I'm a principal with the Hackett Group. Um, spend my time writing research, but also supporting our clients um, through their procurement transformation efforts. So look forward to the conversation today. Sounds great. Uh, I've been looking forward to our webcast with Kurt for around half a year now. So very excited to be uh, bringing it to all of you. First, let me uh, tell you very briefly about um, what I am doing here today and what Precoro does and how does it happen so that Kurt is with us today. So Precoro uh, is a cloud-based fund management system that helps businesses streamline their procurement processes, manage their budgets more effectively. We provide tools and features that automate various aspects of procurement. Uh, one of our main focus points is on supporting our clients throughout the implementation process instead of just simply providing access to the platform so that we design the process together and stay in touch periodically with our customers after the software has been implemented. This allows us to learn best practices and see the results of using them as they unfold over time. I see that a lot of people today are our customers, so I'll be very brief. Um, here you can see the process uh, that uh, Precoro helps companies uh, cover. Uh, request, approve, source, order, control. We bring transparency and predictability to your company's spending workflows. We're very process oriented and give you the agency to gather and process requests, build custom approval logic, manage purchasing documents and gain complete control over your company spending. Um, just very, very briefly on the housekeeping. So when you joined on the right hand side, you can see the chat window and the Q&A window. Uh, please use the chat window to communicate any technical issues you might have, or just say hi to other participants. And then please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit any questions you have for a speaker that will come up during the webinar. We'll have a short Q&A session at the end, but please don't wait with your submissions. We'll make sure that all of the questions get answered either live or by email after the webinar. And before we dive in, let me just briefly remind everyone about the structure of today's webinar. In this session, we'll examine the key priorities of procurement leaders as we head into 2024, as well as the capabilities they're investing to achieve their objectives. We'll touch upon procurement priorities for 2024, discover CPO strategic investments in areas such as advanced analytics, supply data, and AI, discuss how organizations are actively leveraging advanced analytics, to unlock the potential of supply-related information, delve into procurement, uh, navigating ongoing cost reduction pressures by emphasizing core capabilities, and so much more. So now, uh, you know, done with me, let me give up the floor to Kurt. Kurt, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. And as Lada said, let's uh, please go ahead as we go through the presentation um, and look at the results of Hackett's 2024 Procurement Key Issue Study. Uh, feel free, again, to uh, add any questions into the question uh, box there, and uh, we will try to answer them on the fly. A lot of keep me honest if something comes in and I miss it. Otherwise, we will address questions at the end. Okay, so let's jump into this. I've already introduced myself. Um, you know, those of us in the procurement space, you know, or even anybody picking up a newspaper over the last couple of years certainly are aware of some of these key environmental facts, factors that have really been in, impacting procurement's agenda, um, which make this year's procurement key issue study interesting, right? We're 
you know, we've, we've had a lot occur over the last couple of years, kind of post pandemic. We had inflation, um, which has kind of obviously diminished a bit here in the U.S., but certainly in other parts of the world, still a big factor. And there's still questions here in the U.S. and certainly on the labor side, service side, we're still seeing some a lot of inflationary pressures. Um, at the same time, you've got this fear of recession that a lot of companies are talking about, uh, you know, just kind of preparing for something to occur. Um, so far, at least here in the U.S. and at other major parts of the world, we haven't seen it. All Europe's been impacted a bit more. Um, but there is some expectations that 2024 is going to be um, some recessionary pressures felt by most companies. Um, geopolitical turmoil, right, impacting supply chains and supply continuity, um, certainly with Russia, uh, Ukraine, the Middle East and China, all impacting supply continuity issues. We've talked about, you've heard about tighter work supply, ESG objectives, a lot of stakeholders pressing ESG, environmental, social and governance goals, um, impacting procurement from a sustainability and diversity, supplier diversity perspective. So a lot of factors out there kind of coming together at once here over the last couple of years. And they've really had an interesting impact on procurement. They've had an in impact on everybody, obviously, but a very interesting impact on what we've seen from a procurement perspective in terms of their priorities and capabilities. Um, so let's, let's jump into it. This is a study we do every year we look at it from a GNA perspective, right? So we don't just do it at the procurement perspective. We actually talk about what's happening at the enterprise level, but then we dive down into the functions of procurement. Um, so this is a study we do. This is really one of the first times we're kind of releasing the 2024 results. So you're getting kind of a sneak preview of this before it goes wide. It's always something we spend a lot of time with our clients kind of going over um, so this is one of the first looks out into the market of actually looking at the results of the 2024 procurement key issue study, which we wrap up around now. Um, and again, this is a study that went out into the market and is looking forward. It was procurement leaders who are providing perspectives on what they expect for 2024. So we'll take a look at that and we'll see also uh, how some things have changed and how some things have remained the same. Um, let, let's start with a key slide that we kind of look at every year just to gauge the temperature out there with respect to, you know, this idea of how much is on procurement's plate, right? And we see that on the left-hand side, the total workload volume, we get an estimate of, you know, are you feeling like there's a lot more you're doing this heading into 2024 compared to 2023? No surprise, we always see this going up by a substantial amount. Uh, particularly these days with those five factors that we just looked at um, in the environment. And then we kind of compare that to what are we doing from an investment perspective in procurement, right? And as you can see, there's generally this large productivity or efficiency gap that we see whether we're looking at staffing investments or procurement operating budgets. The good news is uh, staffing investments and operating budget investments for procurement are expected to be up slightly. Uh, that's better than flat or down like they are for some of the other GNA functions. Um, obviously, there's a re direct return on investment of procurement. So it's good to see that, uh, you know, we're still making at least incremental investments in resources and budget. Um, but we're also making big investments in technology. Now, it's slowed down. The growth of that investment has slowed down a bit from previous years, but it's still pretty substance. And obviously that is kind of the, that's the anecdote to that productivity efficiency gap, right? Invest in technology. It's what we've been talking about from a digital transformation perspective. It's what almost every company we're working with, whether we're talking about procurement or the broader enterprise is focused on implementing technology to improve overall productivity and efficiency. And you see it here for procurement. So. Um, the investment in technology is still strong in the source to settle space uh, with an expected about a 5% growth in technology spend heading into 2024. Uh, for, and that's, that's the estimate from the procurement leaders that we, uh, that we surveyed. Um, and again, that's, that's the anecdote to kind of fill that gap in terms of doing more with less. Well, we got to leverage technology to make that happen. Um, and it's interesting, and I'm, we're not going to show this here, but it's interesting if you kind of 
look at the numbers, right? I mean, if, if you don't know much about the Hackett Group, we're a very data intensive organization. We do very detailed benchmarks. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at those that have invested in technology, you know, for the last several years, they've really been leaning out from a resource perspective that, you know, that transactional purchase to pay process. That is where a lot of the bodies, FTEs, have been reallocated from. But today, and I would say over the last year or two, we've noticed this, uh, we're also seeing some productivity improvements in some of the more strategic resources with some of the more advanced technologies that we're seeing today. So interesting times. All right. So let's do our first, uh, our first poll. Uh, can we put up a poll? So quick poll here for those that are participating. What is the most pressing priority for procurement heading into 2024? Just give me an idea of what you think the uh, most pressing uh, priority uh, will be here. Just uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, seconds to figure that out. And then we'll take a look at what the study says, right? So if you could just pick one of these, uh, spend cost reduction, the traditional value proposition of procurement, mitigating some of these inflationary pressures. So what we call cost avoidance that we've been seeing, improving the operational efficiency of procurement, uh, this broader digital transformation journey, uh, continuing to manage some of the supply continuity risks that we've been looking at over here over the last couple of years or something else. If you could just take a second to, to identify one of those, that would be great. All right. All right, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and show the results. So as of right now, it seems like mitigating inflationary pressures is winning. It's okay. About 30% of the votes and then improving operational efficiency, digital transformation, supply risk management, and other. Okay, thanks for uh, those responses. All right. Um, and that doesn't surprise me, uh, although I'm a little surprised that we didn't name the number one. Um, this is how it looks, right? Top 10 priorities for procurement heading into 2024. Um, very colorful slide that, I, that we put together. Uh, I'll explain kind of what some of the boxes means or around some of the numbers here in a second. Um, but basically, this is asking the question, if you were to ask procurement leadership, um, and have them prioritize what their top 10 priorities for procurement are heading into 2024. Uh, this is the answer to that question, right? So um, the top three are kind of in this gray box, right? What does that mean? Well, it means this is the same top three we saw last year. Now they are in different orders. Um, we saw kind of uh, spend cost reduction actually drop for the probably the first time we've been doing this study uh, and we've been doing this study for so long as I've been at Hackett, which has been 18 years, we actually saw it drop down into kind of the number three slot. And we saw kind of in, you know, supply continuity, uh, followed by inflationary price increases and beating those back at, in the number two slot. So basically what you've had is number one and, you know, basically number one has, number three jumped up to number one uh, and pushed the other two down. So that doesn't surprise us right now. I mean, the conversations and we're working with hundreds of companies uh, across all different industries. It is all about spend cost reduction right now as we look forward into 2024. A lot of our clients are razor focused once again on that traditional procurement value proposition of driving out cost within the supply base um, that had it's always, it didn't go away over the last couple of years, but it did kind of soften a little bit with the, um, obviously with, with the inflationary pressures that we were seeing and the need to mitigate those price increases. Certainly this depends a bit on where you're located geographically, um, but in general, there's only a couple that, that, that we see big changes on. Now there are some big differences we do see between the regions and I'll talk about some of those here a little bit later. Uh, but in general, um, regardless of where you are, what region you're in, we generally do find that these top three are going to be those top three priorities, maybe slightly rearranged. Um, from a supply continuity perspective, that moved into the number one spot, um, you know, last year. Um, 
I expected it to kind of fall down even even a little bit further than number two. Interesting enough, it's actually still at number two and talking to clients. Uh, they're still trying to manage some of these problems in spot areas, spot categories. Certain industries are still struggling in certain areas. Um, and the uh, service side or labor side is still impacting that to some extent as well. Um, on the inflationary front, again, depending on geographically where you are, certainly still a problem, right? I mean, we've had some good news in here in the U.S. with respect to inflation. Uh, we're starting to hear good news elsewhere um, over, across the globe. But still, there's a lot to be done in terms of kind of re going after those price increases that were passed on by suppliers over the last couple of years uh, and taking those back, right? So there's still a lot of focus on those inflationary price increases and clawing some of those back by our clients. In fact, I just got off a call this uh, earlier before this call, and that was the key focus, right? It was like, what are we doing? We're focusing on going out and, and clawing back some of those price increases uh, that were you know, passed on by suppliers during the inflationary times. All right, so those are the top three. Kind of a return to normal for number one. Surprisingly, supply continuity is still an issue in some areas um, and still managing some of those inflationary pressures um, and the cleanup of clawing back some of those uh, price increases from suppliers. Um, moving down a little bit to number four and five, which are in a green box, that means they've moved up quite a bit. So this idea of acting as a strategic advisor to the business, this is critical, right? Almost every company we work with is trying to move up what we call the value pyramid in order to. And, and if you look at the correlation between kind of how strategic procurement is viewed by its internal stakeholders um, and the savings that they're able to drive, there is a very strong correlation. When we look at the data, this is one of those areas that we always kind of have a discussion with a client. How do your stakeholders view you? You know, do they view you kind of as a gatekeeper, as a as a price negotiator, or do they really you know, view you as this valued partner? You're involved earlier, you have a lot of influence. There is a direct correlation with the amount of savings that companies drive, the more strategically you are viewed. So this is on almost everyone's agenda. It's almost always in the top five. Um, surprisingly, last year with some of the things around continuity of supply, uh, it did get pushed out, but it's back in the top five again. Um, number five is actually a new addition to the top 10. Um, and this is going to be an interesting area, right? We've always kind of talked about procurement's operating model. What should it look like? Where should resources sit? You know, what should be the roles and responsibilities of the various resources? Should we insource versus outsource certain types of activities? You know, what should be kind of core procurement, corporate procurement versus a global business services organization? versus what should be left within the businesses or facilities, those kind of discussions, the build out of centers of excellence within procurement to support your strategic activities, as an example. Um, what makes this area really interesting right now has been the advancements in technology over the last, you know, I'd say 10 years and how that is impacting procurement's operating model. Uh, but also, obviously, this topic of Gen AI, right? We're hearing a lot about that in the market, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, at Hackett, we are kind of launching a solution that looks at kind of by activity across GNA processes, the application of so advanced technologies like Gen AI and the impact they can have on processes. We put out a paper recently that said Gen AI is going to drive, I believe the number was about 30 to 40% efficiency improvements across the GNA functions. Um, and I think the number we put out there was five, four or five years from now. Um, so very big activities occurring around the operating model and the use of some of these advanced technologies like Gen AI. Um, so exciting stuff there. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the other areas that kind of stayed about where they were from last year was this idea of digital transformation, transforming that source to settle process, right? It's just kind of foundational. I showed you the productivity and efficiency gap. The anecdote to that is digital transformation across source to settle. 
So that has been in the top five, just out just outside the top five for the last five or six years. And TPRM or third party risk management, right? Managing risk related to suppliers outside of the supply continuity area. Again, a big focus. One of the topics that we actually saw drop a fair amount, I think it was number, I wanna say it was number four uh, last year was analytics and insight capabilities, which is a bit surprising. Um, but to me, I think that just got crowded out a little bit by some of these other areas. And we'll talk about that as a capability in a few slides and show you that there still is quite a bit of emphasis on leveraging data um, and I'll go to, you know, I'll make the statement that data is kind of becoming even more, you know, moving beyond spend analytics, but just data for either sustainability scores, uh, you know, or, or risk scores or understanding risk. All of that information is becoming more and more critical to procurement. And we'll take a look at that uh, in a few slides. Another interesting area is the ESG, you know, Kyle, is the ESG topic, right? Uh, we actually break ESG up as it pertains to procurement into two components. There's a sustainability component and there, there is a, so, you know, basically scope three, scope two type emissions, scope three being those in the supply chain, scope two being in, scope one and two being internal and through the generation of, of the you know, providers we use. But the, um, the other being supplier diversity, right? So number nine is really looking at that sustainability piece. Um, that is right about where it was last year. Um, although I'll show you a slide a bit later that does show, this is an area that does vary pretty significantly right now between um, US-based companies and European-based companies. Um, and you know, I think some of the regulatory aspects are really driving it as a critical development uh, capability in the EU-based organizations a bit more than what we're seeing here in the U.S. I would say sustainability has slowed down a little bit in terms of its emphasis, but still pretty important. Um, and that kind of rounds it out. This idea of agility, so just being responsive and having a more flexible operating model, that that continues to be a key theme as well, right? We've seen a lot of variability out in the in the market. We've had to change directions uh, quite often here over the last three or four years. Um, for obvious reasons, um, you know, just be having that flexibility and agility to adapt. So that's the, that's the top 10 list, uh, very focused on supply continuity and savings, um, but also focused on how do we be more productive and really harness insights and, and information um, through a new operating model, leveraging some of the core digital transformation, but some also some of these more advanced technologies like Gen AI, all helping us become more strategic in the eyes of our internal stakeholders, exert greater influence and drive broader value even beyond spend cost reduction savings. Um, so that's where we are with respect to the top 10 priorities. Uh, I do see some stuff in the chat. Let me just tell, let's see. Okay, so we've got a lot of a little bit of comments there. Uh, okay, so I see some comments in there. No direct questions for me at this point, but feel free to put those in if you do have them. All right, so lo just looking at it from a time lag per or time perspective, I think it's important, right? Um, this kind of does mirror what I already talked about, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, as we talked about. Um, you know, cost reduction is almost always in the top two or three. Uh, supply risk kind of made a, an appearance back in 2021 uh, around continuity post pandemic. Um, inflation made an appearance in 2023 into the top five. Uh, and those three are still kind of this one, two, three priority that we are dealing with. All right. All right, so kind of in line with that, right? And th this is a little interesting to me, this slide. I, I kind of expected it to look a little different when we got the data back, but I think there's some things driving it here that we'll talk about, right? Um, you know, spend cost reduction as a, is the number one priority, as we saw cost avoidance, you know, being those mitigating those inflationary pressures or those softer savings. Um, that is how we're kind of defining cost avoidance, so the bottom. Uh, line there. But basically, the question we asked was, 
hey, heading into 2024 compared to 2023, what do you think is going to happen with savings, right? Are savings, are your, you know, are your projected savings or, you know, the level of savings you're being told as a procurement function to go out and drive, is it going up? Is it going up substantially? Is it kind of staying the same or is it actually going down? Um, and you see the results here, right? You've got about 27% of participants actually said that their projected spend cost reduction savings are actually gonna diminish in 2024 compared to 2023, compared to about a third that said they'll relatively stay flat, plus or minus you know, 2% versus about 40% that did say we do expect um, our spend cost reduction targets or or savings to go up in 2024. Um, th and this is what I what, what I expected was that 27% on the left hand side there, people saying it was going to decrease, was going to be a lot less than that. And there'd be a lot more companies saying um, we expect uh, price, we expect to drive more savings. And and the expectation that I we assumed was driving that really was around this idea is look, you know, and again, I think this is what might be causing it. When I talk to my European counterpart, um, I run our North American operations. I have a counterpart who's over in Europe who runs our European uh, operations. Um, we, I think what's driving this is, 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 is he and I do have kind of a different perspective in terms of what our clients are telling us when it comes to kind of the inflationary environment and this idea of spend cost reduction being back on the table. We talked to our North American clients, they absolutely are. They're going after them aggressively. I would say the majority of them are at least flat or increased. Uh, whereas some of our European counterparts are kind of in, still in that inflationary environment uh, and really kind of emphasizing the cost avoidance side of it. So I think that might be what's driving this. Um, and then if you look at the cost avoidance bucket, this one's a little bit cloudy because not all companies actually capture the cost avoidance. Um, but the fact that, you know, we saw a lot of emphasis on this over the last couple of years. So the fact that 43% said, you know, we've already been doing a lot here to drive cost avoidance savings. And we continue to expect that the same level of that in 2024. <clears throat> and 35% tell us that that's increasing. What this tells me is there still are a lot of companies that are managing some of those inflationary uh, pressures. And again, that's gonna vary depending where you are from a geographic perspective. Um, so a bit of a surprise when I first saw this, just thinking about kind of where I sit in the company, in the conversations I'm having today. Um, but I guess if I look at it from a, a larger global perspective, um, I can kind of understand why the numbers came out the way they did. All right. So th the other aspect of this is, you know, we've got our priorities and hopefully our priorities are very much aligned as a procurement leader with the enterprise objectives that we see out there, right? You know, um, and that we're reporting up to senior leadership, this is kind of the C-suite uh, and senior business leaders, what are we reporting out from a performance perspective? I mean, you would like to see them very closely tied to the priority list in general, which would mean our priorities generally tend to be very much aligned with the enterprise priorities. But in general, and, and, and they generally are, but there are some gaps, right? So there's two aspects of this. This is on the left hand side, what is procurement reporting out in terms of KPIs and dashboards to its senior company management? And then on the right hand side, kind of if you think about the, the, the procurement leadership, what are their bonuses tied to, right? No surprise to anyone on this call, I'm sure, that year over year spend cost reduction savings Almost every company is reporting that out to senior company management. Uh, it by far and away is the dominant metric we see. And the majority of the management team has their bonuses tied to it. Um, and then next is this cost avoidance bucket. Now, six, two thirds of companies actually reporting that out to the senior leadership. Um, that's an increase from where we maybe we would have saw it three years ago. Again, that 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 emphasis on, you know, the inflationary environment that we've been in. Um, but interesting, if you look at the top, you know, four, 
its savings, whether it's cost reduction, cost avoidance, and then these two ESG components, right? Supplier diversity and sustainable procurement. Right now, those are the top four metrics being reported out at the senior uh, executive level. Why is that? Well, certainly a year over year cost savings and cost avoidance drive the savings aspect of it. But as we all know, kind of the board and you know the C-suite is very interested in this ESG topic, um, you know, and they want to see that the organization is aligned to it. So those kind of round out the top four. Um, you see other areas in there as well that I won't get into. Um, it's a little interesting that supply assurance is so low, considering we've been dealing with the issues for um, the last you know, couple of years. Uh, again, some of that likely has to do with we're taking. If we take a manufacturing versus services view of this, which we do, um, you actually see supply assurance obviously higher and more manufacturing based organizations than service based organizations. Um, when it comes to kind of team bonuses, so kind of aligning the compensation of procurement executives, um, again, it's very closely aligned, right? It's year over year savings, cost avoidance. Um, you know, what are we doing from a supplier diversity perspective? But then you also have things on working capital and internal stakeholder satisfaction, um, as well as how you're managing talent, right? Those kind of are the next ones. So they're not perfectly aligned with what's being reported up to senior management, um, but more tied to kind of what's happening within the procurement function itself and some of those overall enterprise objectives that are out there. Okay, so that's that's where we are here. And I think this is the time we'll do our second poll, right? So a lot of I could get you to yes. execute the second poll. And while I'm executing the poll, there is a question in the chat by okay. Wade on um you can see it on findings regarding what calculations and metrics companies are reporting directly related to inflation. Are most companies reporting the impact of inflationary offset of savings? Yeah, interesting question. So there's really two questions there, right? Are mo I'll answer the second one you know, first. Are most companies reporting the impact of inflationary offset of savings? I, I think what that question is asking, so I hope I get this right, is you know, okay, if you if you drive cost reduction and you've got this amount over in this bucket, but yet across, you know, the rest of the spend base, there are the inflation, inflationary pressures over here, uh, do you kind of offset the cost reduction with the inflationary um, increases that you saw in these other spend areas? Um, the fact is most companies don't. There are, and I, I have an exact percentage, I just don't have it off the top of my head. It is something we, we recently asked in our savings methodology study that we do. Um, you do see that a few organizations, and when I say a few, probably around, if the numbers are probably around 10% or so, actually will do some type of offset of the inflationary uh, increases with the, and come out with a, a net, you know, um, net out the savings amount. Most do not. Um, in terms of calculations and metrics companies are reporting directly related to inflation, um, certainly the one around, um, you know, cost avoidance, right? What are we driving in terms of cost avoidance savings is by far away the number one metric we're seeing. Um, the, the tricky part of that, however, is how do you calculate that? And, you know, that gets very complex, right? I've had hour long discussions with clients on very specific, you know, if you, let's, let's say you go out to, um, you know, you've got your incumbent supplier and you go out into the market, your incumbent supplier's price goes up, um, you know, it, yet the market goes up by a certain amount. You're, it, it, you get into all these really unique situations in terms of calculating that. But the shorter an short answer is, Generally, what companies are measuring is the the cost avoidance bucket that they're driving, right? And they're not netting out their cost savings number, their cost reduction numbers um, against any kind of inflationary um, offsets that are occurring. Some do, but it's not typically the norm. Um, it's actually an interesting question. We've had a lot of CFOs want want them want procurement to do that. A becomes a very difficult process. You see it more sometimes on more of the direct side as opposed to the indirect side. 
um, if you've got a few kind of core raw materials, um, but across indirect, not generally done. It just gets too complex. Thank you. That's the very, very interesting. I hope that answers Wayne's questions and I'll publish the poll in a second. Okay. Thank you for taking the question meantime. All right. So, um, all right. So, did, so I think we've had a chance to answer the poll. Well, how's the poll looking in terms of responses? Um, I have just published it, not to divert attention uh, okay. from your answer. So let's give it a couple seconds. Okay. So the poll, what critical development areas will procurement make investments in in order to deliver on its priorities in 2024? So we just looked at the 2024 priorities. It's cost reduction, number one. It's, um, you know, it's, it's supply continuity risk still in that number two position, cost avoidance. Uh, and mitigating inflationary pressures or cost avoidance is number three. Um, what are they going to, and then so on and so forth. What are the capabilities now that they're going to build out to actually drive that? Are they making, you know, investments in data and, and analytics? Are they making investments in talent? Is it investments in technology? Uh, is it investments in improvements in strategic sourcing and category management? Is it around supplier relationship management? Where are those investments going? Um, so give everybody a couple more seconds, or if we've got an answer, let's, let's talk about the results. So far, number one seems to be data and analytics with about 44% of votes, then technology transformation, strategic, strategic sourcing and category management, talent management, and then supplier relationship management and other. Okay, perfect. All right. Let me get a little more light in here. So I've gone a little bit dark here. Um, all right, thank you for that. So let's let's take a look. So the next slide is really answering that question around procurement initiatives, right? If we think about priorities, and on the other side, we've got initiatives that we're undertaking to address those priorities, where's the focus? What are the top 10 improvement initiatives on procurement's 2024 transformation agenda? So if you look at the actions that they're actually taking, they have projects or investment. Number one is data analytics and reporting. You know, I mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned on the key priorities list that, you know, analytics and reporting as a priority had slipped. But when we look at it as an improvement initiative, it is in that number one spot. So again, big data, advanced analytics, Gen AI, all of that is driving it, right? And uh, one of the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at the different types of analytics that are occurring because obviously, you know, 28 years ago when I got into procurement, when we talked about analytics, it was historical spend analytics. That's what we talked about as analytics. It is much broader these days. It could be focused on risk. It could be focused on emissions. Um, there's a broad set of analytics that we need now to help support procurement against its priorities. So we'll take a look at that in a, in a few seconds here. The other is talent. Um, and I can personally tell you from the amount of activity that I am personally involved in in supporting our clients, talent transformation continues to be one of the hottest areas out there. I think last year that was number one and data analytics was two. So they just kind of swapped places this year. But talent continues to be uh, a big area investment. And I think there's a number of things driving that, right? First, their first digital transformation is changing the way our resources work. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the key things we see about those who implement technology, they really lean out that purchase to pay process so they can reallocate those resources to higher value types of activities. Well, there's a training element that goes along with that. Uh, we're also seeing, we had been seeing a lot of changeover in or turnover in the talent pool within a lot of our clients. Um, and we have been coming in and helping develop those resources around the strategic sourcing process, negotiations, or even in you know, interpersonal skills in terms of how do we go about influencing and driving transformation within the organization so we can be successful in our strategic sourcing category management efforts. Um, so that, that is a big area. Um, the other areas are some of the traditional core processes and, and tools that we rely upon to deliver procurement, right? Category management and strategic sourcing and supplier relationship management. Those were all in the top five last year as well. So still this emphasis on strategic category management, the traditional strategic sourcing approach, 
and investing in relationships with suppliers to help create innovation, continue to drive out cost savings, so on and so forth. So those are the three big processes. Technology continues to be a big focus. Um, and then we see sustainability and third-party risk management. Just to comment on sustainable procurement here, this is, I made a comment before, this does kind of vary depending on geography. If you look at it from a priority perspective and you segment the data by North American-based kind of companies versus European-based companies, it's, it's kind of both in that you know, eight, nine spot. So it's from a priority perspective, it's up there, it's in the top 10. However, if you look at the actual initiatives that are being undertaken by procurement organizations, in the EU, it's a top two, top three improvement initiative. Um, in, the, in, the, in North America, it actually drops out of the top 10. So if I was to give you a view of this of North America, you would not see sustainable procurement in the top 10, which is a bit surprising considering it's a top 10 priority and there's been a lot of emphasis on it. Uh, and last year we did, did see it in that geographic split in the top 10 for North America. Um, you know, I think we've all heard here in the, in the U.S., for example, on a lot of conversations around sustainability. I think there's being a conversation occurring here where certainly regulation in Europe is driving the need to act immediately where what's happening here, I think, by, in some of the North American based corporations is they're saying it's a priority. You know, stakeholders are putting a lot of emphasis on it. However, there's not that burning platform yet. It's a it's a 10 year goal that executives have put out there. So we're, we're making some incremental investments in it, but not maybe the level of investment that we're, our, our EU uh, counterparts are making. Um, but, you know, there's expected regulatory, re, re, um, you know, reporting and action um, coming into play here uh, in the U.S. market at some point, And that certainly will drive act more activity around this. Um, and then rounding out the top uh, top 10, you certainly see investments in third party risk management, a lot of focus on that, contract managements, including CLM solutions, and the strategic business partnerships of so forming stronger relationships with our stakeholders. And one of the hottest trainings we're doing is kind of this CRM for procurement these days, right? You know, customer relationship management for procurement executives. All right, so continuing along here, this is kind of another view of this, but what I want to focus on here is really this idea of this critical development box. So if you think about capabilities that procurement has and is building and is focusing on, from left to right is, is importance, from bottom to top is how mature we think we are. Okay, so from a talent, we generally, procurement's basically saying from a strategic sourcing perspective and from a talent perspective, those are really important. And we feel like we've done a good job kind of maturing those capabilities. Uh, on the core procurement technology, so that source to settle, and it's kind of borderline. But when you start getting into things like sustainable procurement, data analytics and reporting, SRM, third-party risk management, we generally are in the down in that critical development box where we say it's important, but we're still pretty immature. Um, something like supplier relationship management, for example, so building out a formal SRM approach to managing your suppliers and engaging your suppliers to, and managing it over the life cycle of those relationships, that has been down in this box for a very long time. And it's interesting because it's one of those topics that, you know, you saw it here, on the previous slide as a top five kind of capability or improvement initiative. But as long as I've kind of worked that hack it, it continues to kind of be one of those areas that just companies can't quite get right. And there's a number of reasons for that. There's a lot of common mistakes people make when they try to launch an SRM program. All right, so let's, let's get to the technology piece of this, right? Um, the, the, other, the other part of the key issue studies is looking at priorities and capabilities, but we also do do a deep dive into kind of looking at capabilities around what we look at from an end-to-end -end kind of core procure, procurement technology ecosystem. So this is looking at that source to pay technology ecosystem. 
everything from what we define as an upstream kind of procurement tool, so things like spend analysis, e-sourcing, CLM, and then the downstream procurement tools, you know, the purchasing process through invoicing, through payments, through supplier onboarding and performance management. Um, and then we also have a number of supporting and emerging technologies and what we, what we lump into what we call digital automation. So this is kind of the framework we use to look at the ecosystem of technology out there. Um, and then in the study, we actually dive down and take a look at where companies are with respect to level of adoption, for one thing, expected growth, um, and then also key is, are they getting the ROI associated with it? Or are they achieving the realization of their business objectives that they sought, they, they started out with, right? So kind of an interesting way to view this, right? And let's start by kind of looking at what we call these end-to-end -end core procurement technology functionality. And that's kind of that top box, right? Everything from up, the upstream procurement tools and the downstream procurement tools. And we'll take a look at those, right? And the general theme here is the technology across kind of the source to settle is generally pretty mature. You see about half the respondents, 50 to 60%, almost across all these areas are saying they have 40 to 60% saying they have a large scale deployment of this functionality today. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means they've implemented the technology uh, the functionality within their environment, technology environment, um, and they're using it as across the organization, right? When you start looking at, you know, sometimes we've implemented technology, but it's still kind of in a pilot phase. It's not being widely used. That's in the lighter blue box, so the pilot. But still, when we kind of look at the current adoption levels of these, if we include large-scale deployments and pilots, generally across kind of the end-to-end -end core procurement technology, we're generally in that, 70 to 85 percent range with respect to adoption and fairly good growth. Right. You know, we're looking at double, you know, double digit growth for almost all of these different technologies. Right. Now, whether you buy them as a point solution or a suite from a single solution provider, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so I don't think that's probably that surprising, although, you know, it's certainly larger companies are going to have, you know, larger levels of adoption or probably as a, as a if you looked at the global one, one, if you look at the Fortune, you know, 100, they're going to be probably a lot higher in terms of adoption as we get into medium-sized businesses. They're going to be on the lower side of the adoption, obviously. But I also think it's important to kind of look at the business objective realization or the ROI associated with these. In general, this looks pretty good. Uh, you do have a few outliers like supplier onboarding um, down there at the bottom, where you're, you know, you see, you know slightly less than half actually say it fell short of expectations. The technology and the implementation, 43% um, said it fell short of expectations. Now, that doesn't surprise me from a lot of the discussions we've been having with our clients. Um, you know, this supplier onboarding process is kind of a key aspect of the risk management, third-party risk, uh, you know, third-party risk management approach, where we collect a lot of information, send it through cybersecurity, uh, review those types of things. Um, and there's been some of the suite solutions that are out there. Uh, the capabilities in those in those suites didn't actually live up to the expectations that some of the, uh, you know, some of the companies had. Uh, so this is an area there's been a lot of activity. If you look at companies out there, they're making investments in here, um, but it's a big focus right now. So that that's a hot spot. All right. So go to the next layer, right? So the next layer on down is some of these, um, you know, the supporting and emerging procurement technologies. This is, this gets a little, you know, a little less adoption, right? Obviously we look at kind of that dark blue, large scale deployments and you're with the exception of uh, project pipeline and savings tracking tools, which are usually standalone solutions and category management tools. And I'm a bit surprised category management is that high, but I think there's some reasons driving that. Um, with the exception of that, most of these capabilities, things like, you know, things like uh, supplier performance management, advanced analytics, tailspin management marketplaces, uh, supplier collaboration, innovation tools, this whole SRM suite of tools, 
uh, tend to be less largely deployed, a lot of pilot kind of instances out there. Still relatively good expected growth on most of this, um, but you also find that there's kind of a broader dissatisfaction or fell short of expectations when we get to these tools, right? Um, you know, you take, for example, supplier performance management and supplier collaboration and innovation. That doesn't surprise me that those two areas tend to jump out as areas of least, you know, fell short of expectation the highest in this, this piece of this, right? We've long heard that, you know, kind of the solutions out there don't really uh, holistically address the SRM approach, whether it's engaging with and innovating, collaborating with suppliers, or simply just managing ongoing performance of those, right? So that's an area of weakness that we've seen in the market. Um, certainly also, if you think about things like tail spend management, there are some interesting tools being put out there in the market to help support that now. Um, the one I'm a little disappointed is, is supply risk management, considering that's been such a big focus of companies over the next, over the last few years. Uh, still about almost 40% of companies saying they're not achieving their objectives with respect to uh, business realization. That's an area that, you know, it's interesting, kind of pre-pandemic, it was difficult unless you were in a regu regulated environment to kind of get investment for those, S you know, supply risk management tools and data sources. Uh, we've seen significant investment over the last few years in that space. Um, and even though some of those pressures are, are kind of going away from the continuity side, we do expect now that people, are, you know, fresh off some of the supply constraints issues they ran into, they will continue to build out those capabilities, diving into kind of the tier two supply base as well. Great. And then five, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just uh, one, one small comment. We have around 10 minutes left. I love, uh, the things that you're sharing. I'm wondering if uh, the people that are with us today would mind us running a little bit over just to hear all of your insights. Please uh, put it in the comments and Kurt, uh, just take it into account and please continue. Sure, yeah, and I've only got a couple of slides left here, so we're almost done. Um, so, some of the, and, and again, that now we're looking at some of these automation technologies, the things we're hearing about RPA, Gen AI, chatbots, Still not a broad usage of these. You see the numbers in terms of adoption are pretty low. Growth expectations are still pretty light, although I would argue, you know, some of these we're probably going to see greater growth. Um, although, you know, the, the, in the areas they're being used, for the most part, things like RPA, for example, which is the biggest adoption here, those that have adopted it have actually said they've got pretty good value out of it. Chatbots, not a lot of people have adopted them very broadly, but those that have has said they've gotten pretty good uh, benefit out of it, so on and so forth. So low adoption remains to be seen here. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the Gen A piece. Uh, well, I guess I have more than a couple of slides left. Let, let me talk real quickly here just about this question of ERP suite point solution, right? Uh, we started looking at this question we always get, should we go with a suite solution that covers the entire source to settle space and we get you know one provider to you know give us all of this or should we break it up into kind of these you know best in class or point solutions uh or where should we leverage our erp and this this tries to help tell that story right if it's upstream procurement tools it's certainly mixed but generally you know companies are going away from their erp solutions and using either suite or point solutions right particularly point solutions on the spend analytics and then on e-sourcing and CLM, you know, you're generally looking for kind of a sweet solution, but it is mixed. You get into the downstream procurement tools, generally looking for a sweet solution, right? We are leveraging some capabilities in the ERP as well, uh, generally not going out for point solutions when we're looking at kind of the, the, you know, kind of the downstream purchase to pay process. We generally try to go to one, one organization to get that functionality, although certainly not all the case. You see 20 to 30% uh, actually did go with point solutions in those solutions. And, and sometimes that does make sense. On the supporting and emerging procurement technologies like supply risk, supply collaboration, uh, again, it's a bit mixed, but generally kind of leaning towards point solutions and suite solutions, rarely leveraging ERP capabilities. And we're talking about things like 
you know, the SRM capability, we generally have been relying on suites and point solutions. And then typically things like, you know, these niche solutions like Project Pipeline, almost always point solutions. So, and then these digital automation tools, some of these newer tools, almost always point solutions, but also looking for the suite providers to build these capabilities within their, within their solutions. So kind of an interesting view of the world when you look at it in terms of the ecosystem and where are we sourcing and where does the, where's the functionality reside? Our ERP, a suite solution that we're getting from a uh, single provider, or do we go after and say, I want a specific spend analytics tool that specializes and I'm gonna go after that point solution. So helpful slide there if you're looking at that ecosystem. I talked about analytics, right? And it, certainly spend analytics, you see from an importance and maturity perspective is in that right-hand box. That's the one we typically think of. But we also need data and information on supplier diversity, supply market analysis, supply risk analysis, supplier performance, cost optimization, so cost modeling tools, maybe to model inflationary pressures, sustainability reporting, all of that stuff. Procurement is becoming a very data intensive organization to provide greater visibility and make greater decisions tied to those priorities. And so this is kind of the first time we kind of looked at the different types of analytics and the relative importance and maturity. Um, but I think there's some interesting topics in this just in terms of, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies, for example, big focus on, well, how do I calculate carbon emissions and looking to third parties to help provide that information? Where do I get information for cost modeling so I can better understand the impact of inflation? What about risk and analytics? Where do I get the information and data for that to better provide granularity, not only into tier one, but also tier two suppliers, so on and so forth. So a very hot and important area. Um, on the Gen AI side, um, Look, you know, about half of the people are out there are piloting something or using something in the last study we did. Um, typically, the big areas are on better understanding spend and tail spend and, you know, kind of what we can do, projecting spend, looking for opportunities for savings, using Gen AI to do that. In the contract authoring, so helping author contracts, um, using contract templates and applying Gen AI on past history and help you know generate a, a contract template for a need. Um, and then in developing category strategies, right? Helping us develop category strategies are the big areas, you know, top three areas where people are telling us we expect kind of Gen AI to get used in procurement. Um, and then finally, this is kind of the last slide. You know, I talked about kind of optimizing procurement's operating model. It really comes down to one of the big components of that is this service placement question that we get asked all the time, right? Does, does the activity or the, do the resources reside in a corporate procurement function? Do we leave them within a business unit? Do we put them into a center of excellence? Do they reside in a shared service environment like a global business services environment? or where do we outsource activity? Um, and as you can see in procurement, not a ton of outsourcing, it's really around kind of the P, you know, purchase order processing and some of the supplier information management where you're getting activity. Um, and you can kind of look at the numbers here, still a lot of corporate procurement kind of centralization, although certainly some of this stuff is being put into the centers of excellence and a lot of it, particularly that the transactional activity is getting migrated to a global business services environment. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. All right, so that's all I really had. I won't necessarily go through the conclusions because I know we're kind of right at time. I think I'll, if there's one more question that I can answer that or we can let folks go. Uh, let's see if there is a question, please add it to the chat. Just as a side note, amazing insights, very, uh, very excited to hear. We had a small discussion in the comment section with Richard on everything from ESG, uh, you know, to to integrating the suite solution and point solutions. Uh, one comment uh, that Richard made that really stood out to me, and I thought maybe you could comment on that, um, that U.S. companies will realize their lag in sustainability when the EU legislation bites. Um, any opinions on that? Um, well, I think, and as I said, right, when I talk to my European counterparts it, and we look at the data, 
from an EU perspective, this is a, it, uh, you know, sustainability is a big topic, right? It, it, from, a, from a capability building perspective, it's top three. It's really just the US based organizations that maybe aren't kind of getting involved in, aren't being impacted by some of those, you know, regulations that are occurring yet that are kind of more treading softly in this space. As soon as they, as soon as they're kind of business, so, you know, they're doing business in some of these areas, as soon as they start to feel those pressures and we're seeing it, right, we're getting a lot more questions from our clients, even though they're North American based on, hey, we're doing business over there. How are companies kind of, you know, complying with these regulations? We're starting to get a lot more questions in there. So uh, I think you're going to, you know, the, 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 the EU based regulations are starting to impact North America. And I think you'll see an uptick in their activities responding to that. And that's typically the way it does happen. And then I also think you're going to see some regulatory actions in the U.S. based environments that are going to drive activity uh, to a greater extent around that as well here in the U.S. I agree. It seems like now um, in the U.S., as also Richard mentioned about um, the diversity being the primary focus in the yeah. U.S., kind of the the counteracting counterpart uh, to the uh, um, ESG focus in the EU and it seems to me that now they act more as a um, initiative based action um, in the other countries so for example in the US uh, the ESG and in EU the diversity and less on the strategic level for companies but then as soon as you see more regulatory action uh, they will converge yep. eventually yeah and, you know, supplier diversity is exact opposite, as you said, right? Long been a focus here in North America, starting to see it grow other parts of the globe, including the EU. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't seem like uh, we have any questions left for us. So thank you so much, Gert, for all of the insights. We will share the recording and the slides uh, with everybody who attended today. Thank you so much for joining. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out either to Kurt or me. We'll be happy to talk to you later. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.